Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Your August solo show. And because the Q3 Premium Member course on Magical Geography starts next week, I am neck deep in placeness. So that's where we are this month. Place is the place we find ourselves. So um, just thinking back on my return flight from the mainland to Hobart uh, late Saturday afternoon, uh, as the plane kind of dipped and you can sort of see out into the ocean, it looked cold. Now, it's the Southern Ocean, and it's still effectively winter here. So it is cold, obviously, but... I've landed in a lot of latitudes over the years, and I guess this is presumably something to do with the angle of the sun. Light on the ocean looks colder here, or at these latitudes, north and south, uh, than near the equator. So sort of instead of warm sunset colors, you get cold metallic ones. Uh, And it felt like, or what sort of came to mind, is one of the things that Hobart actually is, which is the main jumping off point for Antarctica. The ocean on Saturday afternoon looked like the sort that you would have to sail on to get to Antarctica, right? Because obviously you do. Uh, It obviously looks calmer uh, near Hobart than it does the closer you get to Antarctica, but uh, nevertheless, it had that light level and sensory feel. Now, this sounds obvious, but is more complex when you unpack it. Hobart's status as unofficial capital, I guess, of Antarctic expeditions is because it's near to the place, more or less, and far from the origins of most expeditions. So particularly in that afternoon light, you had that sense of farness from elsewhere and also nearness to what is effectively the unknown. Now, the farness is something I'm more familiar with grappling with uh, just in general in my life. So Tasmania has two thirds of Australia's entire stock of 19th century buildings, including my farmhouse, I guess, but only about one thirtieth of the national population. So colonial lifeways are at least visibly or evocatively, as close to hand as Victorian lifeways, which is the same era, obviously, uh, are in London. And if you want to, if you kind of want to dial up the exquisite horror of farness, think with the simple facts of geography, where you know, Tasmania is located, and then fold them into the realities of 19th century travel. So it feels far today, but today you can get back to London in about 30, 33 hours. In the 19th century, to get from London to Tasmania, it would take longer than it takes drones to get to Mars. That's the sense of distance and geography that's sort of folded into the colonial landscape. So farness is something I think with often. This week, I want to explore the other side of that. I want to explore nearness, Uh, but more specifically how you draw far places to you, how magical geography is more than human feet pattering over unresponsive dirt. Place can evoke you, I'm living proof of that, and you can evoke place, and I mean literal evocation. There is, of course, the uh, more commonly understood waking up of, or perhaps coming into alignment with, uh, is a better term, the local space-time you find yourself in. But there is also the drawing near of what is far. To do this, I'm going to read an essay by Ursula Le Guin from the book I mentioned to James uh, on a recent podcast episode, and the book's called Dreams Must Explain Themselves. She wrote this essay in 1986, and it is called Heroes. You'll see why, as we go through it, uh, it's been rolling around in my head. So now, amusingly, 
As I get the book, picture me picking up the bifocals off my chest where they hang on a dainty chain. And, uh, and we'll begin. All right. For 30 years, I've been fascinated by books about the early explorations of the Antarctic, and particularly the books written by men who were on the expeditions, Scott, Shackleton, Cherry Garrard, Wilson, Bird, and so on. All of them not only men of courage and imagination, but excellent writers, vivid, energetic, exact, and powerful. As an American, I wasn't exposed to the British idolization of Scott that now makes it so chic to sneer at him, and I still feel that I am competent to base my judgment of his character, or Shackleton's, or Bird's, on their works and witness, without much reference to the various biases of biographers. They were certainly heroes to me, all of them, and as I followed them step by frostbitten toad step across the Ross Ice Barrier and up the Beardmore Glacier to the awful place, the White Plateau, and back again, many times. They got into my toes and my bones and my books, and I wrote The Left Hand of Darkness, in which a black man from Earth and an androgynous extraterrestrial pull Scott's sledge through Shackleton's blizzards across a planet called Winter. And 15 years or so later, I wrote a story, Sewer, in which a small group of Latin Americans actually reach the South Pole a year before Abmundsen and Scott, but decide not to say anything about it because if the men knew that they had got there first, they are all women, it wouldn't do. The men would be so let down. We left no footprints even, says the narrator. Now, in writing that story, which was one of the pleasantest experiences of my life, I was aware that I was saying something rather, or saying some rather hard things about heroism, but I had no desire or intention to debunk or devalue the actual explorers of the Antarctic. What I wanted to do was join them fictionally. I had, uh, I had been along with them so many times in their books. Why couldn't a few of us, my kind of people, housewives, come along with them in my book? or even come before them. These simple little wishes, when they became what people call ideas, or when they become what people call ideas, as in, where do you get your ideas for your stories from? And when they find themselves in an appropriate nutrient medium such as prose, may begin to grow, to get yeasty, to fizz. Whatever the idea of that story was, it has continued to ferment in the dark vats of my mental cellars and is now quite heady, with a marked nose and a complicated aftertaste, like a good 69 Zinfandel. I wasn't aware of this process until recently, when I was watching the public broadcasting series about Shackleton, as well-conceived, cast, and produced as a series about Scott and Amundsen was shoddy. There, was, uh, there were Ernest Shackleton and his three friends struggling across the abomination of desolation towards the pole, two days before they had to turn back only 97 miles short of that geometrical bindu which they desired so ardently to attain. And the voiceover spoke words from Shackleton's journal. Man can only do his best. The strongest forces of nature are arrayed against us. And I sat there and thought, oh, what nonsense. That startled me. I had been feeling just as I had always felt for those cold, hungry, tired, brave men, and commiserating them for the bitter disappointment awaiting them. And yet Shackleton's words struck me as disgustingly false, as silly. Why? I had to think it out, and this paper is the process of thinking it out. Man can only do his best? Well, all right. They were all men, of course, and a long way from the suffragists back home, they honestly believed that man includes women, or would have said they did if they had ever thought about it, which I doubt they ever did. I am sure they would have laughed heartily at the proposal that this expedition include women. But still, man can only do his best. Or to put it in my dialect, people can only do their best. Or as King, oh damn it, I don't know this, King, you'd... Hystera says in the great and bitter end of the Mahabharata, by nothing that I do can I attain a goal beyond my reach. That king, whose dog's name is Dharma, knows what he is talking about, as did those English explorers with their clear, fierce sense of duty. But how about the strongest forces of nature are arrayed against us? Here's the problem. What did you expect, Ernest? Indeed, what did you ask for? Didn't you set it up that way? Didn't you arrange, with vast trouble and expense, that the very strongest forces of nature would be arrayed against you and your tiny army? 
What is false is the military image. What is foolish is the egoism. What is pernicious is the identification of nature as enemy. We are asked to believe that the Antarctic continent became aware that four Englishmen were penetrating her virgin whiteness and so unleashed upon them the punishing fury of her revenge, the mighty weaponry of wind and blizzard, and so forth and so on. Well, I don't believe it. Uh, I don't believe that nature is either an enemy or a woman to humanity. Nobody has ever thought so but man, and the thought is, to one not man, no longer acceptable even as a poetic metaphor. Nothing, nobody, arrayed any forces against Shackleton except Shackleton himself. He created an obstacle to conquer or an enemy to attack, attacked, and was defeated. By what? By himself, having himself created the situation in which his defeat could occur. Had he reached the pole, he would have said, I have conquered, I have achieved, in perfectly self justified triumph. But, forced to retreat, he does not say, I am defeated. He blames it on that which is not himself, nature. If man wins the battle, he starts, he takes the credit for winning. But if he doesn't win, he doesn't lose. Forces arrayed against us defeat him. Man does not, cannot, fail. And Shackleton, speaking for man, refuses the responsibility for a situation for which he was responsible from beginning to end. In an even more drastic situation for which he was even more responsible, <laughs> in his last journal entry, Scott wrote, We took risks. We knew we took them. Things have come out against us, and therefore we have no cause for complaint, but bow to the will of providence, determined still to do our best to the last. I have seriously tried to find those words false and silly. I can't do it. Their beauty is no accident. Things have come out against us sounds rather like a projection of fault, like the forces arrayed against us, but lacks any note of accusation or blame. The underlying image is that of gambling, trusting to luck. Providence, which is how Scott referred to God, does seem to come in as the other, a will opposed to Scott's will, as nature was opposed to Shackleton's. But something you call by the name of providence is not something you perceive as an opponent or an enemy. Indeed, the connotations are maternal, nurturing, sheltering, providing. The man may be speaking like a child, but not like a spoiled child. He takes responsibility for the risks taken, and beyond hope, finds duty unalterable, to do our best to the last. Like Eudistira, he knew what the last meant. Nothing in me finds this contemptible, and I can't imagine ever finding it contemptible. But I don't know. I found so many things silly that just a few years ago seemed fine. Time to bottle the wine. If you leave it too long in the wood, it sours and is lost. I don't want to go sour. All I want to do is lose the hero myths so that I can find what is worth admiration. All right. What I admire in Shackleton, at that moment on the barrier, is that he turned back. He gave up, he admitted defeat, and he saved his men. Unfortunately, he also saved his pride by posturing a bit, playing hero. He couldn't admit that his weakness was his strength. He did the right thing, but said the wrong one. So I go on loving Shackleton, but with the slightest shade of contempt for his having boasted. But Scott, who did nearly everything wrong, why have I no such contempt for Scott? Why does he remain worthy in my mind of that awful beauty and freedom, my Antarctica? Evidently, because he admitted his failure completely, living it through to its end, death. It is as if Scott realized that his life was a story he had to tell, and he had to get the ending right. This statement may be justly seen as frivolous or trivializing. The death of five people isn't just a story. But then what is a story? And what does one live for? To stay alive, certainly, but only that? In Amundsen's practical, realistic terms, the death of Scott and his four companions were unnecessary, preventable. But then, in what terms was Amundsen's polar journey necessary? It had no justification but nationalism and egoism. Yeah, I'm going to get there first. When Scott's party stopped for the last time, the rocks they had collected for the Museum of National History were still heavy on the sledge. That is very moving, but I will not use the scientific motives of Scott's expedition to justify his polar journey. 
It was a mere race, too, with no goal but winning. It was when he lost the race that it became a real journey to a real end. And this reality, this value to others, lies in the account he kept. Amundsen's relation to his polar run is interesting, informative, in some respects admirable. Scott's journal is all that, and very much more than that. I would rank it with Wolf's or Peep's diaries as a personal record of inestimable value, written by an artist. Scott's temperament was not very well suited to his position as leader. His ambition and intensity drove him to lead, but his inflexibility, vanity, and unpredictability could make his leadership a disaster. For example, his sudden decision to take four men, not three, on the last lap to the pole, thus oversetting all the meticulous arrangements of supplies. Scott arranged his own defeat, his death, and the death of the four men he was responsible for. He asked for it. And there were certainly self-destructive elements in his personality. But it would be merely glib to say that he had wanted to fail, and it would miss what I see as the real heroism. What he made of his failure. He took complete responsibility for it. He witnessed truly. He kept on telling the story. Unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. His self-sacrifice was not, I think, deliberate, but his behaviour was sacrificial rather than heroic. And it was this, and it was as that unheroic creature, a writer, that he gathered, garnered, saved what he could be saved from defeat, what could be saved from defeat, suffering and death. Because he was an artist, his testimony turns mere waste and misery into that useful thing, tragedy. His companion Edward Wilson, whose paintings are perhaps the finest visual record of Antarctica, kept a diary of the polar journey too. Wilson was a far sweeter, more generous man than Scott, and his diary is very moving, but it has not the power of Scott's. It is not a work of art. It records, but it does not ultimately take responsibility for what happens. Self-absorbed, willful, obsessed, controlling, Scott was evidently an artist born. He should never have been entrusted with a polar expedition, no doubt. But he was, and he had, so fierce a determination to tell his story to the end that he wrote it even as he lay in the tent on the ice, dying of cold, starvation, and gangrene among his dead. And so Antarctica is ours. He won it for us. The end. So, I find that particularly moving, obviously. I think, uh, in that inimitable Ursula way, she finds the right heroes to bring far places near, and in a way that makes them, I don't want to say bioavailable, but in a way that makes them approachable uh, and understandable for us. And I guess that leaves us, when you think about it, with several questions to finish the show up on. How do near and far places cohere in your experience? How do you bring far places near? Which heroes light the way for you in places that you may not ever physically visit? And as these heroes light the way, what exactly does their light illuminate? What can you see of place or encounter or experience of place when you aren't, quote-unquote, in or on it? And perhaps what I like about this essay is hearing the backstory of how Ursula's engagement with Antarctica transmuted into fiction for her, so that I was on, I've read The Left Hand of Darkness, I'm sure many of you have as well. It never occurred to me that the experiences of Shackleton and Scott um, are there on winter. But how else, how else do these things happen, right? So it's not just which heroes light the way and what exactly their light illuminates for you. It's what you do with what that light shows you. 
Until next time. Thank you.